welcome to the Mondo Weiss podcast. I'm your host, Dave Reed. At Mondo Weiss, we cover the movements, activists, and policymakers who affect the struggle for freedom in Palestine. Today, we have a conversation with Sam Bahor. Sam is a Palestinian-American businessman, born in Youngstown, Ohio, and now living in Ramallah, Palestine. He is currently an independent director at the Arab Islamic Bank, a policy analyst at Al Shabaka, the Palestinian Policy Network, and an advisory board member of the Open Society Foundation's Middle East and North Africa office. He spoke to Mondo Weiss founder and senior editor, Phil Weiss. Well, good morning, Sam, uh, and good afternoon to you uh, in, in Palestine. Uh, thank you very much for joining us. Um, I, I was... Uh, you know, I'm excited to talk to you about this initiative you've had about confederation. I want to hear your ideas about confederation as a, um, uh, uh, I don't know that you say solution, but as the, 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 the best path, uh, toward, uh, a peaceful outcome. Um, but I want to start with the news and, and, uh, and also it's exciting anytime, uh, I speak to someone in Palestine to hear what's, you know, going on in one of my favorite places in the world. So, uh, first off, um, uh, I, I know you've had some acid comments about, um, Israeli leaders and their relationships with, the uh, American administration, uh, lately, both prime minister Bennett and defense, uh, excuse me, foreign minister, um, Yair Lapid have visited the United States and had very good, uh, exchanges with the Biden administration. What's your view of that? Thank you, Phil, for having me on and for Monday Weiss for sponsoring this. As you know, I'm an avid follower of uh, of the site. Thank um, you. Yeah. That's a good place to start because the American influence in this uh, region is uh, not, not exaggerated in a false sense, but it is exaggerated in the real sense. So when we see these Israeli leaders rushing to meet U.S. officials in the U.S., it is a kind of, uh, we joke here that they're going to Mecca to do the pilgrimage, uh, because without the U.S. support, there is no military occupation, and Israel would not be what it is today. And they know that very well. So the, these trips that are going, I think, serve two purposes. Bennett has a very weak government in terms of the coalition that he was able to put together, barely, and needs this international kind of credibility. And he believes that comes from showing that he has the ability to enter the White House and have a rapport with the U.S. administration and the State Department as well. So part of the trip for him, the prime minister of Israel or any of his ministers, is to uh, create this public rapport that uh, we can do business with the U.S. just like Netanyahu or any other Israeli government that maybe had a stronger standing. They're definitely not going to convince the U.S. to support Israel. That has been the case for 70 years. And in Congress, they basically, like Netanyahu once was caught off guard on a tape, said they control Congress. Mm -hmm. So they're not going to convince the U.S. of anything. Uh, it's more of them trying to serve a domestic agenda to mm -hmm. show themselves as real leaders. Mm -hmm. On the U.S. side, I think the Biden administration has an agenda as well. And it's not an agenda to move any kind of process forward or, God forbid, hold Israel accountable for what they're doing here. It's more to show that the administration is in strong support of Israel, like any administration before it, especially the administration that was prior to Biden, which is the Trump administration. Mm -hmm who bear hugged Israel almost to death. Uh, and I think Biden, because it's not about Biden, it's about the Democratic Party, knowing that Israel is a fault line in U.S. domestic politics. That's mm -hmm. sad, but that's the fact. You cannot run for mayor in New York or a governor of any state or, God forbid, the U.S. presidency without declaring your support for Israel. Mm -hmm. Something is very wrong with that equation, but that's a topic for another mm -hmm. day. So mm -hmm. the Democratic Party, through the president, wants to show that we are in line with the Israeli government. And it doesn't matter if the Israeli government is a peace-oriented government, which this one is not, mm -hmm. or is a settler-oriented government, which this one is. Mm -hmm. uh, their interest is to show the U.S. public that they are in line with Israel, whatever Israel has to offer. 
and it's more for U.S. domestic politics and electoral politics than it has to do with anything about the equation on the ground here. Now, I want to unpack your statements a little bit. Uh, first, from the Israeli standpoint, you know, I just want to observe that um, uh, there are th- thousands of leaders around the world who would give their left arm for even, uh, you know, a phone call with uh, the president of the United States. So um, it may be a show uh, I don't know, you didn't use that word, but it may be a show of uh, international prestige that they're able to get these meetings, but it's pretty convincing because, you know, I don't think the Biden administration, it, it had its first uh, contact, uh, personal contact with an African nation uh, in the last couple of days. I mean, the whole continent of Africa, over a billion, a billion point three, pi- pi- uh, 300 million people, whatever it is, um, uh, you know, it's relegated to this country of, uh, of uh, you know, I, I would say 12 million people, but a, a very small country. They, they obviously have a great deal of access, Israel. So that must be real and meaningful, uh, not just to the, uh, to the Israeli people, but to the world. Correct. And I think that there's another dynamic that's at play here which is following the Abraham Accords, which is this normalization framework between Israel and Arab states, uh, that Israel being given this free access to the U.S. um, in a way creates a platform for Arab states to think, wrongfully so in my opinion, that the only way to address the U.S. on other items that they might need to move forward Mm -hmm. is to make amends with Israel enter these Abraham Accords, and Israel, if they're convinced of you, can deliver you to the U.S. There's a little bit of truth in that point because Israel has the largest lobby in the U.S., which Mm -hmm. is very influential, Mm -hmm. and congressmen, uh, senators, fear this lobby of APAC. Mm -hmm. And when Israel wants to use that lobby to punish, they can do so very easily. Mm -hmm. So I think that the Arab states, these non-representative governments, uh, are looking for a bridge into the U.S. And they, right. see, and, and they see that Israel has that open access. Uh, it is a show, in my opinion. Uh, these governments are non-representative, uh, and they have no understanding of how the U.S. works. Uh, they have no intention to do the footwork needed, like Israel did, rightfully so, I mean, for their own reasons, in the U.S., in all 50 states, in order to have influence in Washington. Uh, the Arab states think that they can buy their way through uh, access to the U.S. And today, buying means joining the Abraham Accords. That's a U.S. agenda uh, to be able to create this normalization framework, excluding the Palestinians by design. Unfortunately, the Biden administration came and did not change that model one inch. Uh, They're continuing in the same process. We just had the one-year anniversary of the Abraham Accords. Um, no mention that excluding Palestinians from these accords uh, basically uh, defeats the purpose of having an agenda for peace in the Middle East. So, mm-hmm. yes, I mean, yes. Israel is given access, uh, partly given access, I think, out of U.S. desire to show that it has access, but also because uh, Israel has over influence on the U.S. domestic system. And the president knows that and his party as well. Right. And as Sam, Sam, as you said, there's issues that we will have to leave for another day, but it isn't as if um, uh, Israel, the U.S., haven't delivered to these Arab monarchies and states on there have been rewards for joining these, uh, quote unquote, Abraham Accords. uh, Yes, there's been an arms increase in the region. Uh, these what I call arms deals, because that's mm-hmm. ultimately what they are, mm-hmm. has created an arms race in our region led by the U.S. supporting these governments that normalize with Israel by giving them uh, very high tech, uh, sophisticated weaponry under the auspices that they're all preparing for some kind of fallout with Iran. Uh, but ultimately, it's increasing the amount of U.S. weapons on the ground in the Middle East, and those will come back to haunt us. Uh, Remember, these are governments that don't have civilian Mm -hmm. control of their military. They are autocratic regimes, which are Mm non-representative. So they can turn on the U.S. uh, on a dime, Mm -hmm. um, as we've seen in the region happen uh, elsewhere. 
So, I mean, I don't think we should be excited about an arms race deal mm -hmm. uh, that is supporting basically U.S. arms manufacturers to get more weapons into the hands of uh, non-representative and non-accountable actors in the region. Mm -hmm. Sam, just to introduce you to the listeners, if they're not familiar with you, you know, you're a Palestinian American businessman who went back to Palestine after Oslo uh, with the hope uh, that that actually, uh, e even though you had read the Oslo Accords, uh, like very few others had and saw how problematic they were, you were willing to give it a chance and you went with your family back to Palestine. And I believe you continue to spend time in Ohio as well. Is that correct? Uh, I visit my parents and sister once a year before Corona, but yes, we get back about once a year. Okay. So, and I introduce you to say that you are someone who, um, in my view, really knows how to break bread with a lot of different people. Um, you get, you, you are a business person, uh, you're practical, hard headed, you are willing to talk to, we're, and we'll get to this in our discussion of Confederacy. You're willing to talk to a lot of Israelis um, to push that for, and yet you are, um, and and so and 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 you understand the importance of business in uh, the um, uh, as you would the political economy of nations, uh, but you are uh, pretty adamant on these uh, and. Uh, and about these Abraham Accords and, and how they leave out Palestine. Am I reading you correctly? Uh, first, thanks for the introduction again. I mean, yes, I'm a Palestinian American, which means I don't sleep well at night, not because of the U.S. reality nor the Palestinian reality. I, I'm, I am a businessman, but I'm not blinded by business. I don't think business is the driver or should be the driver in the Palestinian-Israeli arena. We are living a political conflict par excellence. This is a military occupation, and whether Israel likes it or not, military occupations comes with a set of rules called the Fourth Geneva Convention. So we're not the first people to be military occupied, nor sadly will we be the last. But Israel does not have a free hand to do what it wants to the people under their occupation or to the lands that are being occupied. The entire world has noted that in hundreds, literally hundreds of UN resolutions. Having said that, my reference point is not the Abraham Accords or the Oslo peace process or the next initiative out of the 50 or 60 initiatives that have come out of various parts of the world over the years. My reference point is the body of law that relates to military occupation. That's what I gauge Israeli actions on. Uh, ultimately, we're going to end this occupation, just like mm -hmm. uh, South Africa ended their apartheid. Mm -hmm. This occupation is an odd one because it has been prolonged. Usually occupations are uh, shorter in time. Uh, I'm not sure the law of occupation took in consideration a 50-year occupation. Mm -hmm. And that's why you have very respected organizations like the Human Rights Watch, and Yeshdin, an Israeli human rights organization, or Beit Selim, the largest human rights organization in Israel, mm -hmm. starting to use the terminology that we have been using for decades, mm -hmm. which is Israel has crossed the threshold and has become a apartheid state. Mm -hmm. They are violating the crime mm -hmm. of apartheid. Mm -hmm. um, so with all of that being said, no, I don't actually reference the Abraham Accords to be anything of great value. Mm -hmm. I reference international actions, civil mm -hmm. society actions, church actions, synagogue actions, mosque actions, mm -hmm. student actions, mm -hmm. which are calling what the reality is for what it is, mm -hmm. which is a state of apartheid that needs to be held accountable. Mm -hmm. Accountable to what? Accountable to international law, which is what the world put together to regulate relationships between humans on earth. Mm -hmm. um, if the world wants to drop that, we can have the law of the jungle. Israel actually refuses to recognize international law and has accepted the law of the jungle as their mm -hmm. only mode of operation here. Mm -hmm. And we can see how well that's doing, right? Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. So I remain very focused on international law as being my reference point. Mm -hmm. In international law, just to make the point clear, we should not be in an economic crisis in Palestine. The occupier, Israel, does not have the right to block our movement and access, does not have the right 
to take over our natural resources. For example, in the Sea of Gaza, we have located natural gas on mm-hmm. the Palestinian side of the border. Yes. That Palestinian gas well is estimated at four to five billion, that's a B, dollars mm-hmm. worth of gas. If Israel would allow us to tap that, we don't need donor money. Mm-hmm. We are not mm-hmm. in an economic crisis mm-hmm. and we would start developing our country. Mm-hmm. Since we found that in 1999 until now, Israel has prohibited us from accessing that gas well. Mm. And that's only one example. Mm. I can give many more. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So until they're held accountable, we are going to remain in a humanitarian crisis, an economic crisis, and others. Mm. Creating an Abraham Accords, which is bilateral relationships between Israel and other countries of the region, excluding Palestinians by design, mm-hmm. is not solving anything Palestinian. Mm-hmm. If anything, mm-hmm. it's instigating the Palestinians to understand that the cost of occupation has not become high enough for Israel to take no. Mm. And we mm. will do more to bring the cost of occupation higher. Mm. Mm. Uh, thank you, Sam, for that excellent answer. I, I want to ask you now a little bit about the mood in Palestine. Um, and uh, I want to bring up two events uh, to frame that question. Of course, you take it wherever you like. But... Um, Certainly in May, uh, there was this uh, 11-day conflict, uh, pretty much of an onslaught of Israel on Gaza, that uh, was novel in a lot of ways. It only lasted 11 days. Uh, Biden seems to have stepped in and said, hey, you got to cut this off. Uh, Israel suffered uh, propaganda-wise around, I mean, there were huge demonstrations around the world. There was an impatience that we haven't seen even in the United States seem to crystallize attitudes um, against, uh, 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 crystallized inside the progressive movement, the, uh, the, uh, the, the increasing um, disapproval of Israel in the United States. And it also resulted, uh, uh, it's pretty clear, in the Ben and Jerry's decision. There were demonstrations outside Ben and Jerry's, and this uh, decision not to sell uh, ice cream in the occupied territories has become a huge thing, a real burr under the saddle of uh, of of the Israeli leaders. They 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 reference it all the time. It obviously is a huge and important decision. Uh, and um, uh, the other element I wanted to bring in is that the prestige of Hamas, uh, which um, brought on that conflict uh, in some ways, or because of uh, in solidarity with uh, the people of Sheikh Jarrah who are being ethnically cleansed, in solidarity with people, uh, protesters and worshippers at Al-Aqsa who have been denied their basic rights. The prestige of Hamas seems to have gone up in the Palestinian community. Uh, and I guess, so I'm throwing a lot at you, but I'm, I'm, uh, and, and including the American scene, which you've commented on, the progressive shift, and uh, but I'm asking you about inside Palestine. How much do people see this, uh, and and what is your mood right now? That's a lot. I mean, l- yeah. let's start by by noting and framing it in a in a, in a more broader framing. Sure. What happened in May uh, is accumulation of years of a free hand that the occupation has had, especially under the Trump administration with Netanyahu at the, at the helm of Israeli government, uh, a free hand to increase and embed the occupation more and more. What does that mean? Taking more land, building more settlements, arresting more people, demolishing more homes, taking more Palestinian natural resources. The list is very, very mm-hmm. long. Mm-hmm. That culminated in what we saw in Sheikh Jarrah, where Israel was, through its settlement movement, basically uh, stripping yet another group of Palestinians from their homes. Uh, But this time there was the internet and there was the 24-7 news coverage. So people were actually seeing live what happened to the Palestinians in 1948 and 1967 Mm. and throughout those Mm. years in between Mm. as well. Fascinating. But without being seen. Today it's seen. Uh Uh-huh. That got a lot of coverage, and yes. that coverage, I, again, it came at the, uh, the, the, the bottom of a long path of increased occupation activities during the Trump years. Uh, that resulted in Hamas responding. Hamas, I think, PR aside, 
partly was responding to the events in Jerusalem, but more responding to the continued siege of the Gaza Strip, mm. the siege of two million people mm. in a hermetic kind of style, mm -hmm. which has basically crumbled the mm. social, political, economic fabric of the Gaza Strip. Mm. I think they used the events that were going on on live TV in Jerusalem mm -hmm. uh, to create the spark to mm -hmm. act, but mm -hmm. it definitely uh, had something to do with uh, the siege of Gaza as well. I see. That was, a, a, as you say, properly an onslaught against Gaza. It's not the first one, as we know. And I think it's an important footnote here that every time Israel unleashes their U.S. weapons and U.S. coverage against Gaza, uh, they cause tremendous amount of damage. This time we saw the towers falling uh, in live uh, TV as well. Yes. Every time they cross yes. what I would you call... Made, you made that point. I think you made that point before that 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 image of the tower falling for Americans really echoed this uh, this you know obviously the most traumatic moment in American history in the last 25 year or last 50 years that it echoed it we got to see this tower fall in Gaza uh, you made that point and I really appreciate that and and I would call these red lines that Israel crosses they're mental red lines People think when there's nothing on the nightly news about Palestine, Israel, that everything is calm. Of course, it's not calm. Israel continues its occupation. When it reaches the nightly news and you see things like those towers or the bombardment of Gaza, which kills children by the dozens, um, these cross red lines. Those red lines do two things. First, you asked about the international community. It makes the international community take note. This is Israel. This is the country that we keep saying and almost parakeeting that we have shared values with? No, mm -hmm. we don't. Mm -hmm. We have no shared values with bombing buildings that mm -hmm. are empty. We mm -hmm. have no shared value with killing children by the dozen. Mm. So it creates an upbeat in the amount of solidarity the Palestinians gain mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, when the global community sees Israel crossing these public red lines, let's call them. Mm -hmm. But it also does something to the local population here under occupation. I don't think people ally more with Hamas, the group, the party, uh, when they see these kinds of events, but rather they align with the mindset that Hamas articulates, mm -hmm. which is the peace process is dead. Israel has no intention. They don't have to say that today. The prime minister of Israel is saying that for himself today, and that the only language Israel understands is violence. Mm -hmm. Those are lessons that an entire generation or two of Palestinians have mm -hmm. grown up not to hear, but to live. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And those kinds of sentiments are widespread today in the younger community. Uh, if I talk about a peace process, if I talk about even two states, uh, or maybe even just a Palestinian, they're completely detached from the politics of our situation. And they're living the reality mm -hmm. of a fierce occupation mm -hmm. that every once in, a time, once in a while gets slapped by the Palestinians. Rightfully or wrongfully so, mm -hmm. depending on if you're violent or nonviolent and all of that. But overwhelmingly, the entire detachment of a two generations of Palestinians to anything political, I think, is damaging in our society. Mm -hmm. Yes, they're reading reality for what it is, but they don't have the tools to be able to address that reality in a way that can move us forward. Mm -hmm. It's just making them more uh, fierce in terms of almost going back to basics, as if nothing mm -hmm. happened the last 70 years. Mm -hmm. So you hear a lot of the younger people going back to the principles that we had in our struggle from the 1948, 50, 60 era mm -hmm. time. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I don't think that's reality, in my opinion. I think we mm -hmm. need to know that we have a leadership, a Palestinian leadership, mm -hmm. that in one way saved us as a people, because after 1948, the, the plan was that we should not exist as a people. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And you have today, today, literally today in the Knesset, members of the Knesset saying yes. publicly that yes. you only are here because we didn't finish the job in 1948. Yes. So you can Our take mind. it from their own mouth. You have that kind of mindset. And I think the Palestinian leadership should be given credit that they kept the Palestinian struggle for freedom on the global agenda. Mm -hmm. Having said that, and in this prolonged kind of conflict, 
they made a lot of mistakes along the way. Mm -hmm. And a lot of those mistakes was buying into promises by the international community, by the U.S., that if they do X, Y, or Z, like accept two states, remain nonviolent, do a lot of other things, that they will be accepted into the global community and the global community will assist in ending the occupation. Well, Mm -hmm. the leadership did that uh, without maybe proper tactics And it turned out we gave all the concessions that we can give only to find the occupation entrenching itself even further with U.S. support Mm -hmm. and U.S. global cover. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So those are mistakes that were made. Mm -hmm. And I think that the younger generation and maybe even part of the solidarity community needs to understand that this is not a menu. Palestine is not a menu item in a restaurant. I don't open the menu and decide today what I feel like eating. One state, two states, uh, whatever. This is a political process, and when mistakes are made, we pay for it. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And I don't think you can just turn the clock back. Mm-hmm. That doesn't mean, and I'll end here, that doesn't mean that we should forfeit any of our rights. Mm-hmm. But we need to package our rights in today's language, in today's mm-hmm. legal terms, in today's acceptable uh, means to be able to get them. Mm-hmm. And we'll get to Confederation later, but I did that through a model called Confederation. We'll talk mm-hmm. about it later. So, Sam, I'm curious, you um, obviously, you know, you're uh, uh, you're in many ways extroverted. I I see you meeting with lots of different I I see you meeting with lots of people all the time and various very different types of people. What are your discussions? Do you have discussions with young people in Palestine where you make this point? Do you have discussions uh, where you uh, uh, where that expression of frustration is made to you, and and how does that discussion go? I mean, yes, I do have uh, various conversations with different groupings of younger people. Not as much as I would like to. Mm-hmm. Uh, I was hoping that in March, I believe it was, when the Palestinian president uh, finally, after fifteen years of a delay, called for elections even though he called for them in ways that were not proper and so forth. But the community bought into it and was willing to turn a blind eye to the faults of the call for elections because they were so, especially the younger community, uh, focused on wanting to have elections to get past the Mm -hmm. current leadership cohort. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I was really, really hoping that that would happen because that would give me an opportunity to engage younger people within a political framework. Mm -hmm. I mean, this is not a conversation that will move forward in coffee shops. Mm -hmm. You have to have those conversations Mm -hmm. in coffee shops. It's good for mobilizing, but that's not where policy is made. Policy is made in political parties and in political structures. Mm -hmm. And I was hoping that the PLO and the Palestinian Legislative Council would open their doors through an electoral process so we can see these younger people come forward. And that's where I want to really have the conversation with Mm -hmm. them. Mm -hmm. Because that's where they have to deal with the complexity of leadership and Mm -hmm. the complexity of our conflict. Uh Uh Uh, Abbas pulled the rug in the last minute, so those elections did not happen. And I think that was a detrimental mistake that Mm -hmm. will, he'll pay the price for that for a very long time. Uh, But we are all paying the price today because now we have these young people who have a lot of frustration, have a lot of energy, and have no political path to put it in. Mm-hmm. And that political path is needed to be able to create a mm-hmm. consolidated, unified strategy mm-hmm. of how to resist the occupation. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Resistance doesn't live in an island. Resistance mm-hmm. is the result of a political process internally. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And we don't have that political process. So we're left with every group and every person interpreting, interpreting resisting the occupation as they see fit. Mm-hmm. Some of them think should be violent, some of them not violent. Mm-hmm. And that's detrimental to our cause, because without a unified approach to resistance, then our resistance will not have the impact that it should be having Mm -hmm. to raise the cost of occupation. Mm -hmm. Um, Thank you. So I want to move now to the issue of uh, of Zionism and the society that uh, exists just to your West uh, and your ideas about confederation. And part of the way I hear that is that um, that you have uh, you've said that no matter what Israel does, Palestinians are not going away. That is what Palestinians have demonstrated again and again. There is no 
the 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 greatest mil- one of the greatest military powers in the world has not been able to uh, reduce the resistance of Palestinians to uh, ethnic cleansing, colonization, uh, subjugation, oppression. They never will. Uh, and uh, Palestinian samud and pride are just too great. But the counterpoint to that seems to be in some of your uh, analysis that it, it's also true that, uh, 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 and I, I don't know that you've used the word uh, illusion fantasy, you just talked about coffee shop discussions, that that the attitude inside some of the Palestinian solidarity community that somehow Zionism is going to be disappear it's not going to happen that these people are that the, you have a society that has been uh 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 a jewish society in israel that has been formed by this ideology for the last 70 years and it's not going away in a hurry uh and that that so i understand your confederation idea as somewhat ex, as trying to deal with these sort of dual realities. Am I hearing you correctly? And um, can you elaborate in your own words? Sure. sure. Let me let me add one thing in terms of our steadfast, our Palestinian steadfast, proving itself over time that we're not disappearing. Um, having said that, I also believe, given the international community that we live in, and uh, this is not my choice, this is just the reality that I read, uh, that Israel itself is not going, or Israelis themselves are not going anywhere as well. Mm-hmm. Uh, you have an entire two generations of, of Israelis who have been born here, if not more, um, and they see this as their home as well. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I don't see both communities disappearing. Mm-hmm. I do see the models of governance changing. Mm-hmm. And what I mean by that is Israelis need to understand that there will be one or two states here. There will either be two states, the state of Palestine and the state of Israel, and we need to figure out how they're going to work together or live next to each other. Or there will be one state over time, over time, the Palestinians will end up in the Knesset with a bill changing the name of Israel back to Palestine. And you'll have one state of Palestine. Mm -hmm. Those are the options in front of the Israeli community. Mm -hmm. They see or if they don't, that's up to them. When I produced this article, uh, it was a New York Times article that I wrote with my Israeli co-writer, Bernardo, Ber- Professor Bernardo Vashai, we produced this concept. It's not a new concept, mm-hmm. but we thought the timing was important because we had a Biden administration coming in. And we understood that, or we understand that the world has coalesced around a two-state solution. Mm-hmm. Bad mm-hmm. term, but that's what's used. Mm-hmm. And we also understand that the Palestinian leadership fell into the trap of accepting that two-state model Mm -hmm. uh, without getting anything in return, basically. Mm -hmm. So what we did is we said, let's look forward. Let's look forward, and we're not going to deny the Palestinians their rightful rights Mm -hmm. uh, in moving forward. Mm -hmm. And we're also not going to accept illegalities that happen over time, Mm -hmm. like settlements. Mm -hmm. That's not going to be force-fed in the Palestinians' throat. So we said, what's a confederation? We took the two-state mo- two model, and we tried to understand how can we implement, because everyone talks about two states, but it's only been talked about. It's never been really tried yet. Right. Even the peace process talked about. Yeah. But the actual document doesn't talk about two states, if you actually read the Oslo Accords. So all this talk about two states is a little bit artificial because mm-hmm. it's never been tried. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So we said, let's get beyond that. Mm-hmm. Let's envision, for the sake of the Israelis, for the most part, let's envision what a two-state reality would look like. Mm-hmm. We've already recognized the state of Israel. So mm-hmm. the first thing has to happen is Israel needs to recognize the state of Palestine. Mm-hmm. So we can have two states. Both states need to recognize themselves. Mm-hmm. And then we said those two states could enter into for lack of better words, let's call it a contractual agreement, Mm -hmm. a confederation agreement. Mm -hmm. Where we agree, we can contract to do business together, Mm -hmm. whether it's environmental issues, livestock issues, frequency issues, water issues, Mm -hmm. the list is very long. And I assume that if there's no longer a military occupation, we probably have a lot in common to work with Israel to be able to embed both populations. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Where we disagree, We will not put that item into the confederal agreement. Mm -hmm. For example, we don't want to have Hebrew as our national language. So that remains our own issue. 
We want our own legislative body. We yes. may want our own police force. Yes. We want to teach our kids our own history in our own school mm-hmm. system. Mm-hmm. Those can all remain separated from mm-hmm. the confederal agreement. Mm-hmm. The two hard rocks uh, to crack here are settlements and refugees. Mm-hmm. The first thing we did, we said, those should not be in the same sentence. Mm-hmm. First, refugees have an inherent right to come back home. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. It's embedded in international mm-hmm. law. It's, it's common sense. Mm-hmm. Uh, and they need to be able to come back home. Mm-hmm. However, we said, in order to move forward and get out of the conflict that we're in, they can come back home. They can live in their home if they want, if it's available, or to be made available, an alternative, whatever. Or they can live in Palestine as they mm-hmm. see fit. And they will remain a citizen of the state of Palestine. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And if they decide to go back to their home next to Tel Aviv, they will become a resident of the state of Israel. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. That was the way we tried to throw mm-hmm. out an idea for refugees. Mm-hmm. Understanding that the refugees have been made into a monster as well, as if as if every last refugee in the world is going to stand up and rush mm-hmm. Israel. Mm-hmm. We don't think mm-hmm. reality is mm-hmm. like that mm-hmm. as well. Of course not, yeah. On the other hand, we have settlers. Yes. Settlements and settlers are the illegal under international yes. law. Yes. It doesn't, yes. mean, it doesn't matter how big, how small, if it's called an outpost, if it's called yes. a city, it is yeah. all illegal. I agree And with what you. the Palestinians uh, could do if they wanted to would be to offer those settlers today, because they won't be settlers after mm-hmm. this confederation, mm-hmm. if they wanted to remain living inside the West Bank, East Jerusalem, or Gaza, they mm-hmm. would do so as residents under Palestinian law. Mm-hmm. And they become, as they are now, citizens of mm-hmm. the state of Israel. Mm-hmm. We assume that the majority of these illegal settlers will not stay where they are, mm-hmm. but rather could and should be repatriated into Israel. Mm-hmm. We have a live example of that. In the Gaza unilateral disengagement, yes. it's not yes. a withdrawal from Gaza, right. it's a unilateral disengagement, the Knesset in Israel actually passed a law to give a very lucrative financial package mm-hmm. to those settlers in Gaza to go exit Gaza. Yes. And it worked. Mass majority of them took it. The 12 that didn't, we saw on TV showing the show of how hard it is to mm-hmm. leave Gaza. Mm-hmm. But the mass majority of Gazan settlers left and took this very generous financial package. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Sadly, many of them came to the West Bank, but they were allowed to do that under Israeli law. What we're telling Israel to do, and you can start now, Israel, mm-hmm. is offer that same kind of package to West Bank settlers Mm -hmm. So they can be repatriated into Israel because Mm -hmm. Israel, you created the the, the, the settlement reality. You created the settlements. You supported the settlements. You gave them electricity and telecom and sewage Mm -hmm. and protection. Mm -hmm. It's up to you to dismantle that Mm -hmm. reality and bring your settlers back into the state of Israel. Mm -hmm. For those that prefer to live under the Palestinian state, the new Palestinian Mm -hmm. state that will be created with this confederation agreement, the Palestinians could be generous once again Mm -hmm. and allow a number of them, based on our immigration policy, whatever that Mm -hmm. is, to remain as residents Mm -hmm. under Palestinian Mm -hmm. rule. Mm -hmm. It's an article. It's not a full-pledged plan. It's a thought process going forward, trying to serve the global community's desire for two states and the Palestinians' acceptance of that, rightfully or wrongfully so. But at the same time, not forfeiting Palestinian rights mm-hmm, mm-hmm. and moving forward as well. Thank you, Sam. Um, I want to uh, just offer what I'm sure you've heard before, which is the coffee shop uh, 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 sort of. Uh, I sit around a lot with my you know left wing friends, and we discuss what should happen. And I want to offer the kind of vision that I've sometimes heard on the left, which I'm sure you've heard, and that is that. After decades in which, if you think of Palis, uh, in which Palestinians uh, have been um, uh, truly the wretched of the earth in terms of uh, public perception and uh, 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 sort of global reputation and tarred and, uh, and smeared in, in, uh, internationally, that we're entering a new period in which uh, uh, finally, right is being reasserted, and people are coming to their senses about Palestine and understanding that uh, this is a uh, 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 these they are the Palestinians are the indigenous people. They have been ethnically cleansed, uprooted, 
uh, um, uh, cantonized more and more. And Israel, and, and so the left sees this process of delegitimization happening of Israel. And they see that if this continues through uh, BDS and other means, this, uh, that ultimately the uh, uh, Israeli Zionists will have to do a de Klerk South Africa and that, that, uh, and, and that a, a one-state democracy will eventuate in Israel and Palestine when that pressure becomes so intense. And so some would listen to what you were saying about the, the understanding of a plan for the evacuation of settlers that, that you just described and say, and where I'm sure you would agree that the Israeli government is taking no steps in that direction. The Biden administration is taking no steps in that direction. Let's just follow the path we're on of Samud and resistance and delegitimization and ultimately, we'll have one democracy here, which is, it, it feels like one state right now. So how do you respond to that? I think there's a serious flaw in that line of thought. And, okay. and more than one, maybe. Let me just try to lay it out very quickly. First, if you take tools of resistance and think that they're going to produce a political framework, I think there's a mismatch here. Mm -hmm. If I'm building a house and all I have are the best power tools and best hammers and best screwdrivers, I cannot build the house without an architect. I cannot build a house without a permit. I have to have the whole uh -huh. package to build uh -huh. the house. Uh -huh. The tools of resistance are being over-exaggerated. They're very mm -hmm. important. I support mm -hmm. them all. I They're being over-exaggerated that, that they can result, that they can result mm -hmm. into a political frame. Mm -hmm. Remember, we start with saying that this is a political conflict par excellence. Mm -hmm. It will need a political exit par mm -hmm. excellence. Mm -hmm. To get there, you're going to need resistance and all the tools of resistance that we can mm -hmm. properly apply. Mm -hmm. um, and that's a, a very simple kind of way to say that without creating a political frame that can work in the world, not a mm -hmm. political frame that is a desire, a mm -hmm. menu item, something mm -hmm. I would like. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. I would like a lot of places in the world to turn back the, the clock, kind of like the U.S. as well. Uh -huh. And if you're so worried about indigenous people and right has become assertive today, let's start with the native Indians. They're much closer to New York than Ramallah. Yes. So if we're going to apply this, let's turn back the time. Uh -huh. And as long as our tools are there and we keep using them, time will result in some kind of, mm -hmm. you know, big boom. And we're going to find a political solution. I think there's something missing in that equation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The de Klerk moment for Israel will be when they repatriate their settlers. That's mm -hmm. the de Klerk moment. The de Klerk mm -hmm. moment is not where they absorb uh, 6 million, 12 million Palestinians into the state of Israel. Mm -hmm. They have their own issues. They're going to have to work with them for a very long time, such as having 20% of the population of Israel being non-Jewish mm -hmm. and growing. Mm -hmm. um, they're going to have to deal with refugees who want to come back and live in Israel. Mm -hmm. Those mm -hmm. are issues that you know, they're problems that they created and they're mm -hmm. going to have to reap the fruits mm -hmm. of their problems and mm -hmm. correct them. Mm -hmm. Having said that, the Palestinians have a desire for freedom and independence. We have a lot of rehabilitation to do as a society, as mm -hmm. a community. Mm -hmm. If you tell us to jump out of the pan of occupation into the fire of apartheid, because that's mm -hmm. what that one state will be, mm -hmm. I don't think we have the inertia or the, the strength or the the resources to be able to start over again mm -hmm. with an apartheid framing in one state and drop our need for statehood. State mm -hmm. for, statehood for us could be breathing room until two smarter generations of Palestinians and Israelis understand that we could live together in one state. Or mm -hmm. it could be a strategic future where the two states apply their national identity, but on reality on the ground, People can move and live and cross borders. That's how it was when I used mm -hmm. to come here as a child. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I used to leave the West Bank, put myself in the car. I'm on the sea of the Mediterranean. There were wow. no walls and no checkpoints. We can go back to those mm -hmm. days if Israel would drop its mindset of having some kind of exclusive right on the land mm -hmm. of Palestine, Israel. Mm -hmm. So I go back to what I said in one of the earlier questions. The model of how Israel is created on this model of Zionism, this model mm -hmm. of separation, that can be dismantled. Mm -hmm. It doesn't mean that every Zionist is going to disappear. Mm -hmm. 
Mm-hmm. We have we have Nazism in the in the seven in the sixties in the fifties. Mm-hmm. We still mm-hmm. have swastikas being drawn on walls in mm-hmm. in the U.S. today. Mm-hmm. So the remnants of racism stay for a very long mm-hmm. time. Mm-hmm. But mm-hmm. the models that control other peoples through racist regimes that cannot live mm-hmm. on forever. Mm-hmm. And I think Israel, more Israelis, hopefully, will come to their senses to understand that Israel, in its current configuration, cannot exist as the state mm-hmm. that they see it. Mm-hmm. It will dismantle. This this occupation is corrupting them as well. Mm-hmm. Lastly, I'll say, and this is to the solidarity community abroad, we need to be able to respect that the Palestinians have a sovereign right to decide their future mm-hmm. within their domestic scene. Mm-hmm. So although I, I love engaging the solidarity community, I respect the minds that are out there mm-hmm. are really, really helpful. Mm-hmm. But ultimately, how the Palestinians decide to move forward is a Palestinian decision that will have to happen within Palestinian governing bodies. Mm-hmm. And that's why I'm so ticked off that Abbas pulled the rug under mm-hmm. rege- re- rejuvenating mm-hmm. the Palestinian political bodies, because that's where the decision will be made, whether mm-hmm. they want confederation or a two-state model or a one-state mm-hmm. model or a no-state model, the Palestinians have to decide that. Mm-hmm. And the solidarity community should be in solidarity with mm-hmm. what the Palestinians decide. Mm-hmm. Uh, so although we open our arms for all the discussions, all the mm-hmm. input, but we need to be able to respect that the decision is a mm-hmm. Palestinian sovereign mm-hmm. decision to move forward. Uh, just to remind people, uh, you, uh, you know, you're a successful businessman. You live in Ramallah. What is your freedom of movement? Can you just tell me what, where you can go, where you can't go? And as a good reminder to American listeners of what it is to even be in the Palestinian elite. Uh, the, I don't think I'm in the Palestinian elite, but I understand what okay. you mean. <laughs> the short answer is I lived here for 15 years being forced to exit the country every three months because I'm here on a tourist visa. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Israel controls the border. So mm-hmm. when I showed up here in 1995, the only way I can get in is by Israel issuing me a tourist visa for three mm-hmm. months. That continued for 15 years. I'm married to a Palestinian woman since 1993. And 17 years ago, we actually applied for me to get residency status here. Mm-hmm. Israel does not process those applications. They, they pile them up. And they use them as political cards when they need to use them. Mm. What should be a humanitarian issue, like so many other things here, are used as political cards Mm -hmm. that Israel plays. Mm -hmm. After 15 years, I finally, because of some kind of political thing Mm -hmm. that happened, I was issued a Palestinian identity card. Mm -hmm. And what that means is it's an Israeli-issued residency card. Mm -hmm. So I have the right to reside Mm -hmm. in the West Bank. What does that mean? I became overnight just like my wife. Mm -hmm. Limited to West Bay, Mm -hmm. limited to not being able to travel at the airport, not being able to go to Tel Aviv. By the way, before I got this identity card, I actually got an MBA degree from Tel Aviv University. I I remember, yeah. Now with a residency card, I can't even go back to the university. I've become a security threat. So by issuing me a residency right in the West Mm Bay, Israel has basically confined myself Mm-hmm. to only the West Bank. Mm-hmm. No Jerusalem, no Gaza, no airport. I have to go through Jordan if I want to leave the country. And I'm now, instead of having to leave the country every three months, I just have to worry about, after talking to Phil Weiss on a podcast, that I might be arrested tomorrow morning. I become part of the pool of people that could be arrested for any reason, for no uh, charge mm-hmm. brought against me. Mm-hmm. Israelis call it uh, administrative detention. Don't you have a relative right now in detention? 74-year-old uncle, he was released last week after four months of being held, not knowing why. Why do you think he was, uh, he's related to your, on your wife's family? Uh, My father's side. I see. And why, why do you think he was uh, arrested? No idea. I speak much more, I'm, I'm much more outspoken about against the occupation than he is. But he is also outspoken in terms mm-hmm. of speaking against this occupation. So Sam, I, when I read Raja Shahada's book, about relationships with Israelis, sometimes he would be, and obviously he's a poetical type, but sometimes he would be so filled with rage by what was happening that he couldn't talk to Israelis. Do you ever experience that? I mean, I'm sure I do, but at the end of the day, I understand that the Israeli soldier that stops me every time I want to go from one city to the next here, uh, inside the West Bank, Mm -hmm. uh, they are pawns. Mm -hmm. 
Mm -hmm. to an Israeli government which has used and abused their society to uh, advance a very racist ideology Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. in terms of using those people to actually control another population. Mm -hmm. I don't think every soldier is a bad person. Mm -hmm. But when that soldier is wearing a soldier's uniform and is oppressing me, I have no option but to view him as the collective force of occupation. Mm -hmm. I know that because I know many of the soldiers who, after their service, like those friends of mine in Breaking the Silence, Mm -hmm. who leave military service in Israel, which is mandatory, by the way, Mm -hmm. and start to speak out. Mm -hmm. And they basically start saying what they did as soldiers and how wrong it is. Mm -hmm. Those are not bad people. Mm -hmm. They're in a bad system. They're in a corrupt system. Mm -hmm. They're in a racist system. Mm -hmm. And more and more of them are speaking out. Thank you. That's big soul of you. Uh, last point, uh, I want to get in the fact that I wrote a piece that was um, hard on uh, Rabbi Angela Buckdahl of uh, uh, Central Synagogue in New York that you took exception to. And I want to give you a platform, if you want it, to stand up for her. Uh, I said what I had to say, but I, I, want, I know you've met her, uh, and you heard her comments in a more generous manner. Uh, if you want to uh, uh, say something now, this is uh, I'd li- love to afford you the opportunity. Thank you. I mean, I don't need to stand up for her. She can stand up for herself. But the, it caught, the, the article caught my eye because of the picture. I know because I know her. I saw the picture and I was wondering, like, what's this about? Mm-hmm. And uh, the article framed something that she said as being very mainstream, that she wouldn't hire a Jewish activists that are speaking out against mm-hmm. the occupation. Mm-hmm. Um, and the way she said it was within a frame mm-hmm. that immediately after it, she said, that's a wrong thing to think. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I thought it was put out of context. The more okay. important thing here for me is I met uh, Rabbi Angela, who she's an amazing person. She came on a trip uh, mm-hmm. with a program called Encounter. Mm-hmm. And I actually, I think I met her more than once here. Mm-hmm. And it's a group of people, Jewish leaders, rabbinical students and Jewish leader, mainstream leaders. Mm -hmm. These are people who are not in the solidarity community. These are people Mm -hmm. who are in the Jewish establishment, basically. But they cross a a chasm to want to come and see. Many times these trips become even more popular as Israel crosses the red lines that we were talking about on the ground. More and more Jewish Americans specifically say, wait a second, something doesn't make sense here. I've never spoken to a Palestinian. I want to go talk to Palestinians. And they have the opportunity to come here and hear us. And I actually followed her after she went back home after I first met her and yes. heard some of her sermons mm-hmm. after her trip. Mm-hmm. And I can see that she started to embed some of the messaging that we were talking about. She saw a lot of it firsthand. And what I want to mention here is that as Jewish Americans, specifically mainstream Jewish Americans that are starting to see the light, mm-hmm. and there's more and more than we, than we actually think. When I left the U.S., there was only APAC. Today, yeah. you have... Dozens of Jewish organizations on the entire spectrum, uh, and many, many of them calling out against the occupation. As Jewish American leaders, especially leaders, because there's a a big cost to them Mm -hmm. taking a decision forward, as they start transforming out of the indoctrination that they were brought up with Mm -hmm. into reality, it is a painful process for them. Mm -hmm. And if they're heading in the right direction, I think our goal should be to feed them with the information they need handhold them where needed. Mm -hmm. If they make a drastic mistake, we should call them on the mistake. But if they make a statement that they're trying to maybe convince the audience in front of them that that's a wrong thing to say, Mm -hmm. then I think uh, we need to frame it in in that way. So my goal is not to defend anybody. My goal is to say that the Jewish American community, more and more, especially the young, are starting to see that there is no shared value system with a apartheid Mm -hmm. Israel. Mm-hmm. And as they move out of the indoctrination, it's our job to help them come forward and mm-hmm. learn more about the situation so they can actually take action in their own community, mm-hmm. something we can't do because we're mm-hmm. non-Jews. Well, Sam, I want to thank you for that generous statement. And I want to emphasize that um, we left till the end that your 74-year-old relative was in administrative detention for several months. And uh, if uh, American Jews are listening, I want them to hear that and fully absorb that. Uh, I'm an American Jew. Hearing that, uh, I I find it crushing. And uh, so, the, your generosity uh, of spirit in in light of what you and your family are experiencing, I I 
I admire your generosity of spirit. Thank and you I very thank much. You. I, should, I should note a fact. He's a Palestinian-American, 74-year-old, that spent about 40 years of his life in the grocery business in the U.S. So the guy is not foreign to the U.S. I mean, he actually knows more about the U.S. than he probably knows about Palestine. Thank you very much, Phil, for having me on. Thank you, Sam. I really appreciate it. And uh, I look forward to seeing you down the road. Thanks for listening to our show, a production of MondaWeiss.net. The music is from Sound of Picture. Visit our site to sign up for free daily and weekly newsletters on Palestine, Israel, and related U.S. politics. If you're enjoying our podcast, please consider becoming a donor by visiting MondaWeiss.net slash donate. MondaWeiss is a nonprofit publication, and every donation of any amount helps sustain our work. Don't forget to subscribe to this podcast wherever you listen, and please leave a rating and review to help other listeners find our show.